blessed. I'm healed. I'm whole. I'm saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored and anointed, but filled with your power. For what? For the glory of Jesus' name. Man, what a great opportunity to have that as we go into this next part of our service. Well, have I told you lately that I love you? <laughs> well, this is the last message in Love is All We Need series. We had a little sidetrack last week, but that sidetrack went on the right track. <laughs> Amen? Well, that was awesome. And I think today is awesome. Anytime we're in the house of the Lord worshiping together, it's awesome. So love is all we need. And when I was talking to somebody about this before we started, I've mentioned this each week. Somebody said, well, love is all we need. Is love really all we need, Pastor Billy? Is love all we need? Well, yes, it is. And here's why. Because God is, God is love. And it's not just a, a thing that we say. It's not a platitude. It's not just a saying. Yeah, God is love. God is love is scriptural. Okay, and that's what we talked about. I'm just going to read it again. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Dear friends. Let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know love, but does not know God because God is. Verse 16 in uh, chapter 4 of 1 John, you could look at it. In other places in the scripture, it is declared scripturally. When we say God is love, that's what the word of God says. God is love. And in week one of this series, we talk about the importance of learning names and getting to know people and open up a gateway of opportunity to find out a little about their story. And then in week two, we discussed how loving others as we love ourselves sounds good. The great commandment, Jesus talked about it, but it might in theory be a little bit easier than it is in reality. And today I want to just share with you a few thoughts that are going to take really the idea of loving others as we love ourselves to a new level. To a different level, a deeper level, I hope, and pray. So, Father, I ask that you just bless each and every word that is spoken, that it be the, the words that you would have said, and, God, that it would minister to people at the point of their need today in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. So, today, as we get to this next level, we're going to take another step, I hope, to learning to love like Jesus. Now, if we love like Jesus, we're going to then be like Jesus, and that is the goal of every Christ follower, that each day, every day, there are, there are disciplines and things and how to do that, but each day we take another step in our life of becoming just a little more like him. Hopefully, sometimes a lot more like him. But if you get to be a little more like Jesus every day, you're going to see things in your life radically change. I had somebody tell me when I was walking in the church this day, today, talking about how just in a few weeks, God's already moving in his life, changing his life, making you see things different. People are beginning to notice. They said, who is that person now? Seriously, this happened this morning. Who is that person that I'm talking to? This person's different. Do you think that person changed on his own? No, it's the power of God. It's him becoming a little more like Jesus every day, walking in obedience. It's happening right around you, folks. And I hope it and pray that it happens in all of our lives. So as we take another step towards loving like Jesus, being like Jesus, we have to recognize this. When Jesus was here on earth, Jesus loved radically. Now that's a word that makes people go look it up. Radically, profoundly, differently, but totally and deeply. That's how Jesus loved. And he didn't just do it centuries ago when he was here walking on earth amongst us as a man, fully God, fully man. Not just then. He loves that way today. Jesus loves out of the box. Doesn't love in the conventional ways that we just think about it. So today I want to talk about a story in the scripture that shows the powerful, loving nature of Jesus and how he one of the ways that he does this. Now, this is going to be found in Luke chapter 7. You'll also find this story we're going to talk about in John chapter 12, uh, Mark chapter 14, and Matthew chapter 26. Now, this is, one, this is one of the few stories that's recorded in all four gospel accounts. Now, there are many stories that are in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that are identical. But rarely do you see, well, I think there's 18 altogether, but the things that are actually in all four gospel accounts, this happens to be in all four. And each gospel writer had a little different take on the story. But we're going to primarily be in Luke today. I'll refer to some other scriptures as well. Now, Jesus has been invited to a dinner 
uh, by a, a person well known in the community. This guy was uh, was 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 somebody that uh, that was respected. He was a Pharisee. His name was Simon. He lived in Bethany. Now, Jesus was uh, familiar with Bethany. He frequented there. That was the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Bethany is only a couple of miles from Jerusalem. So you go right over the Mount of Olives and head that way. So they went back and forth from Bethany uh, on a regular basis. Now, at this dinner gathering, dinner party, I'll call it, at Simon, the Pharisee's home, there were a lot of other people gathered there. The Scripture doesn't talk about all of them, but we do know Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were there. And there were, but there were other people that were invited into this uh, gathering. And this is what it says in Luke chapter 7, verse 36, beginning in verse 36. It says, one of the Pharisees, Simon, asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Now Luke writes in that translation that a certain immoral woman. In other translations of that same scripture, it says a known sinful woman. So this is a person that had a reputation. Now, this meal, this dinner gathering that Simon had put together must have been a big deal. Now, think about it. Jesus of Nazareth is in his house. At this point in time, this is after he, he, he called Lazarus forth for, for from the tomb in Bethany. So, I mean, Jesus was a big deal at this point in his ministry. And this guy has him in his house. So it's a, it's a pretty important thing. Now, here's this woman. This sinful woman, Scripture says, known to be a sinful woman, is disrupting this party. Now, it didn't make Simon very happy. We'll talk about that in a minute as to why, what he said. But let's look exactly at what this woman did. This is verse 38, Luke chapter 7. Then she knelt behind him, behind Jesus, at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Now, so during this meal, this gathering, this woman. Now, if you look back up at uh, verse 37, it says a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there. She wasn't on the guest list. You know what I said? She wasn't invited to the party. <laughs> she was somebody that was coming in on her own. And she comes in. She's pouring this expensive perfume mixed with her tears over the feet of Jesus. This is a very valuable perfume. There are places in Scripture that identify the value of it, which is translated to about a year's salary for the average working person of that day. Think about that. If you took your annual income and you think about that as something you had of any singular value that was worth your annual income, would that be a big deal to you? I said, okay, would that be a big deal to you? No, we had a lot of like super uber wealthy people in here. Oh, no, that wouldn't be a big deal to me at all. <laughs> It'd be a big deal to me, man. I mean, so, you, you, but this is this the value of what it was. That's, that, that's, that's what's written about. So now for this woman, that, that, that perfume was a tremendous sacrifice. Everything she had, everything, something she really needed, something that had great value to her, she freely gave to Jesus. That's what she did. So again, this scene, here's the woman, the bad reputation, disrupting the, the, the dinner party with Jesus as the guest of honor at the home of a very prominent person in the community, and, and she's weeping. Now, when people weep and cry, usually it's not something that's silent. You'll hear them sobbing, or, you know, sometimes people cry. And it's, when somebody's crying around you in a gathering of people, it's something that you notice, right? I mean, you, you, you don't, it's, it's something that could distract you from anything else that's going on in the room. And that's what was happening. She was weeping. Apparently, there were a lot of tears, enough tears hitting Jesus' feet that she had to wipe them away with her hair, the Scripture says. She's pouring this expensive perfume on the feet of Jesus. So, I would say, now, if I was there, and you just try to picture yourself there, in those days, and here's this woman doing this, I don't think that it was just disruptive to the gathering. I think a lot of people would have thought that that was highly inappropriate for this woman to be doing this to Jesus. And so, Jesus is there, this is happening, but he doesn't stop her. He didn't stop her from doing what she was doing. And she, I think, was obviously unconcerned of what anyone else thought in there because she was there for him. That's why she was there. She was expressing her deep, profound, even radical in her way, love and adoration for Jesus. That's what this woman was doing. And she was unaware of anything else, really, again, that was going on except him. 
So I asked this of myself, and I'll ask you, how would you react if you were one of the people at that gathering? How would you react if this was going on? You know who Jesus is now. They, there's something, there are places that say that Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were there. You know, Lazarus had been dead in that community. Jesus called him forth from the tomb. Jesus is a big deal. He's sitting there, and now all this is going on. What would you, if you were there, think? Would you have any thoughts of maybe some judgment or something, maybe? Thinking that she was doing the right thing, the wrong way? If it was in your house and you were Simon and you had set everything up, nice meal, lit candles, decorated everything, had it all ready to go, and Jesus is going to be in your home, do you think you would want somebody disrupting that? Do you? I don't think so. I think everybody would be, eh. So here's what Simon thought about it, though. This is what he said, verse 39. When the Pharisee, Simon, who had invited him, Jesus, so when Simon, who had invited him, saw, invited Jesus, saw what this woman was doing, he said to himself, and so he's not saying this out loud, he's saying it to himself. Remember that. If this man were a prophet, talking about Jesus now, if Jesus were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner, emphasis added. One thought that this guy had was judging Jesus and judging the woman at the same time. That's what he was doing. Now, others at the gathering, I'm sure, were thinking the same thing. And so as disruptive and unexpected as all of these things are that are happening, and Simon's reacting to him now, what Jesus did, in my view, was even more shocking. Look how Jesus responded. Now, after sharing a quick story, and if you look at Luke chapter 7, you can read this. I won't go into it today, but there's a quick little story Jesus tells about a, a money lender and two debtors, and he's, it's a little mini parable there, if you will. But then in verse 44, this is what Jesus said. So the, it says in verse 44, Then he, Jesus, turned to the woman. Okay, now hear this now. He turned to the woman. And then he said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet. And she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. Now listen to this in verse 47. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. You know what category I want to be in? I want to be in the category of the person that knows all the junk I did in my life, all the failure, all the sin, all the messed up life that I had, everything that I did that was so wrong. I want to be so aware of what Jesus did to forgive me that I can't do anything but express absolute, lavish, profound, radical love to him. I don't want to be perceived as the person that thinks I've been forgiven of so little because I'm a pretty good person and I do things okay. And God's forgiven me of a couple of things. That's right. Well, that's what he's saying. A person who's forgiven little in their mind will only show little love. I don't want to be that one. I want to be the one that's wiping the tears off the feet. <laughs> I want to be the one giving the value of the perfume of my year's salary and sacrificing it all to give him his due of the love he deserves from me, just like the woman. So I think, again, if you look at this, the only thing in my estimation of this story that's more bold and profound than the love that this woman and how she did it expressing to Jesus is the love that Jesus poured back into her life. See, everyone knew, everyone knew this woman was a sinner. Scripture said that, a known sinner. Jesus knew it. He said, and her sins, hey, there are many. I get it. She's a sinner. Okay. <laughs> he was aware of it. But Jesus knew her story. He knew it all. He knew everything she had done, all the bad choices, all the mistakes, all the things that she had been burdened with for her life, her failures, her past. Some accounts think that she may have been a prostitute. Her life was broken. He knew it. And even though he was the guest of honor at this well-known person's home and this important religious leader, where did Jesus turn his attention? Where did Jesus put his focus? 
He put it on the sinful woman, the one with the past, the outcast. That's who his attention was, drift, was, 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 was directed to. And in verse 44 is what it says. The first thing in verse 44, you see him say, he turned to the woman. Before he addressed Simon, he turned to her. See, Jesus didn't see her as disrupting the dinner party. Jesus saw her as the reason for the party. That's why she, he was there. He was there to speak into her life, to do something powerful in her life, and to change her life forever. And we'll talk about some of the things that happened in that in just a minute. He validated her presence by just turning to her before he spoke to this Pharisee. He turned to her. He included her. He made her the focal point, not him. He made the woman the focal point. Instead of chastising her and judging her like Simon did, Jesus praised her. He acknowledged her worth and her value. He acknowledged her sacrifice of what she was doing and what she was giving. And then this woman, I'm pretty sure, those were words she wasn't used to hearing. <laughs> that kind of love. That kind of just... just uh, adoration for what she had done that Jesus was giving her. Jesus encouraged her. And he demonstrated by his actions, not his words, his words too, he demonstrated profound, radical love. And after all of that happened now, everything we just said, answer Simon, all the things, the people there, not liking it, some of them. Jesus puts a triple exclamation point on this thing. <laughs> Here's what he said. Verse 48. Then Jesus said to the woman, after all that, your sins are forgiven. Imagine that. Being here in the spoken voice of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the Messiah. This woman knew just to hear his words saying, your sins are are forgiven. Boom. That went over like a lead balloon at the dinner party. You know why I know? Verse 49. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that goes around forgiving sins? Can you picture that? Here's how I picture it. Who does this guy think he is? Forgiving sins. This woman's a sinner forgiving her. What is he, who is he? Who does he? What is this guy doing, man? Forgiving sins. Now, that's a, little, that's a little bit too far. I know he raised Lazarus from the dead and everything, but, I mean, forgiving sins? I, I can just hear it now, man, the grumbling and the complaint. It does not matter. Look, if Judas can sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver with everything he'd done, it doesn't matter. There are people that can see the express, manifest power of God and still reject him. Don't let it be you. It happens. I don't understand how, but it does. And here these guys are just rap, 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 rap. I'm sure it wasn't all they said. Who's this man forgiving sins? But Jesus, again, to make sure, even though complainers, to make sure that he that he was very clear and that, they, that, that they knew what he said and that he meant what he said, he went on to say this in verse 50. And then Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. When Jesus tells you to go in peace, he is giving you a mandate to walk out of that place in your life into a new life of victory. He's saying to you that you can go from where you were in, 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 in a trajectory heading to hell, and now you're going to be with him in the presence of God forever. That's what he says when he's saying go in peace. Because you can have peace of mind, peace in your spirit, peace in your soul, that you know that one day, because this earth is not my home, that I'm heading to a place where I will forever be in the presence of God. Because of what Jesus did. Not because of what I did, what I bring to the table, but because of what he did. Go in peace. Wow. Gospel accounts in Matthew and Mark said, said, said this. Matthew, Mark 14, 9. I'll just read one in Mark. Jesus said this. <laughs> I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout 
the world. Now I want to stop there for a second. Jesus knew centuries ago that the good news, the gospel of his message, his life, his story, the gospel would be preached throughout the world. You know when Jesus was on the earth, when he was here physically on the earth, living amongst us, you know what they thought the world was? There wasn't even flat earthers back then, man. They thought the Middle East was it. <laughs> I mean, they might have gotten out to Asia a little bit and over here a little bit here, but they had no idea that the Americas and all these other, that, that, that was there. Jesus knew it, though. He said throughout the world, all over the world, where this message of the good news, my message, my life, the gospel is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. So as he sent her forth, go in peace, walk in my victory, walk in my grace, walk in my mercy. As he did that, he was also saying, oh, by the way, let me just put a cherry on top of this. I'm now going to elevate you to a place of honor that where you go every single day that the gospel's preached. And folks, let me tell you something. Every single day, every single hour, somewhere in this world, the gospel is being preached. And as it is being preached, this woman is being honored. Because he said, she will be, not might be, not maybe, not sometimes. She will be remembered and discussed. We're proving it today. We're remembering her, and we're discussing her. Be honored in what you did for our Savior. Love it. Man. This was, I mean, think about how big of a deal that was to Jesus. What this woman did, man, you will always be remembered and discussed. That's cool. <laughs> I don't know, I guess you can tell I got a lot out of that part of it. <laughs> This woman, man, cast aside by society. The forgotten face in the crowd, the, the one that people just walked by and never addressed or maybe took, went out of their way not to be anywhere near her. This woman is now in a place of honor because of the words that Jesus spoke. That's it. That's all it takes. It takes a word from him and it changes. Man. Here's the big idea. Jesus shows us, right there and many other places, what radical, profound, amazing love looks like. We can tell him, but he shows us. Here's what you do. So what if we took women like this, or, not, or people like this woman, the underserved, the outcast, the misunderstood, what if instead of just, even if we don't just totally ignore them, if we just sort of push them away a little bit, or we, in, instead of what if we did it, what if we embraced them? What, what if we, what if we just, what if we embraced them and just said, what can I learn from you about your story today? What, what can I know that I don't know about you? It doesn't have to be everything, just, just something, but, but what if, what if that's what we did? And many of us, and I'm going to tell you, for me, it's my confession. We say it's too much of a distraction. I, I'm too busy. I got too much stuff going on. I, I got I my family. I got all these things and responsibilities and things that I've got to do. I'm in a hurry. But let me tell you something. And many of you have stories about this where you've done this. I believe that things that sometimes that we see and sometimes act on, but sometimes that we see and we pass over are not distractions. They're divine opportunities to do something, to speak into somebody's life that needs it, to do something like Jesus did. There's divine opportunities. And listen, folks, it is my prayer and my hope for my life, and I hope it would be for yours, that I want to see people the way Jesus saw her. Unconditional. I want to see people like the woman saw Jesus. All in. I'm all in. I'm going to give everything I have. I'm going to do everything that I can for you. And I'm going to tell you, 
loving like Jesus, radically, profoundly, without precondition, it's out of our comfort zone. Not some of you and some of us, all of us. It's out of our comfort zone. Here's why. Because we're not totally like him yet. (laughs) But we can make a pursuit daily to be like that. That's why it's out of our comfort zone, because we're not, we're not wired that way. And look, it can be hard. I'm not going to say it's always going to be easy. It can be hard. The woman at Jesus' feet, man, she had to push through, come to a place she wasn't invited, struggle with, am I going to give up all this stuff, or could I just pour half of the perfume on his feet and let me get some money for the rest of it because I need some money? Could she have done that? Of course she could have. She could have decided, man, I don't want to go in there. They're going to judge me. They're going to say all kinds. They're going to look at me funny. They're going to make me feel unwelcome. I just don't know if I can do it. But she didn't. She pushed through. She did it. She took action. She just said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And look what happened when she persevered and she did that and she sacrificed. And it cost her something. If nothing else, it cost her the value of that, and it cost her probably some some uncomfortable feelings. But let me tell you this, folks. Something happens. This is something I've experienced. I want more of it now. Don't get me wrong. I'm not there yet. But something happens when we love people without expecting anything in return. Something happens from the inside out. It starts to change you. It starts to make you different. And sometimes it can't be explained. Sometimes it might be just like the gentleman today that said to me, people just said to me, somebody said to me, there's just something different about you. (laughs) He changes you. Something happens when we do it. Sacrificial love is a great habit to develop. If you're going to develop some habits, make that one of them. And as this is so, this is the thing, as this is made practice in our life. Now, it's not just one time I do it and now I get all the goodies. As it's made practice in our lives, that we're going to live our lives this way, what you're going to find is you're going to find something that is in your life and it's called joy. It, it, it is planted in your spirit. I can't explain it because it's joy unspeakable, but it's there. It's real. It's powerful. It's present. You know that it's there as you live your life this way. Peace begins to replace anxiety. Love casts out fear. As we empty ourselves of ourselves, you know, when you empty something, if you have a pitcher of water or something, and let's say it's full, let's say you empty half of it out. What have you done? You've just emptied out half of the pitcher. That's the lesson. Goodbye. <laughs> Somebody's looking at me like, what are you talking about? If you empty a pitcher, you've emptied something that was in there out. Guess what you've done? You've now made room for something to fill it back up. As we empty ourselves of ourselves and all the things that we think about that matter to us, what happens is we're filled with things that God wants to put in there. You know what it is? It's things like this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all of the fruit of the Spirit. It'll begin to get planted in your life. As you empty out that and make room for this other stuff, this other stuff comes in. And before you even know it, because sometimes you don't know it, all of a sudden what happens is somebody's going to come up to you and say, I'm not sure what it is, but there's something different about you. And what you might be able to say at the right time, yeah, you're right, there is. I'm not where I want to be, but I got more love. I got more joy. I got more peace. I got more (laughs) kindness. I got more gentleness. I got more patience. How did I get there? Because I'm so smart, and boy, I listened to all these motivational uh, teachers and did all this. No! You did it because you're becoming more like Jesus. And it starts with love. If I could get our team to come up, please. Everyone has asked, I think bar no one, either asked or wondered, some to different levels, some more than others, certainly. 
But this question, do I matter? Do I matter? Have you ever thought that? Or... Do I matter? In the big scheme of this world, I mean, I'm just this little person, 8 billion people. Man, do I matter? If there was ever a question that would be an existential question, <laughs> that's it. Jesus answered those questions for this woman. He answered them. God has answered those questions for every one of you. Every single person here, every single person watching, God has answered those questions for you. Do I matter? So here's the answer. If you ever have a place where you maybe are wondering about that or thinking about that, do I matter? Let me tell you what the answer is. Jesus. Well, how does that work? Jesus. Jesus is the answer that you matter. Jesus is the answer to every question and that. You know why? Because the answer to do I matter is in what Jesus did with his sacrifice at the cross of Calvary. It's what Jesus did at the resurrection when he came out by the power of God to prove he was who he said he was. That is the answer that you matter. If you didn't matter. Why would he go through any of it? Think about it now. Seriously. Why would he go through any of that if we didn't matter? You never have to ask that. If we didn't matter, Jesus wouldn't have done it. And by doing it, again, person that was a sinless life, he's the one that had to die? Is that radical? Is that a radical concept? <laughs> Is that profound? Is that out of the box? Well, let's pick somebody that we can sacrifice that has, hadn't done all the stuff he's done. No, he did it. That's radical love, man, as I see it. It's a greater love. John 15, 13 says it. There is no greater love that one, than one that would lay down his life for one's friends. No greater love. So words are important, okay? What we say is important. What we say matters. I don't want to minimize that at all. It does. We can say negative things. We can say positive things. We can say loving things. We can say unkind things. Words do matter, but we need to take love beyond words. We need to take it beyond words. Take action that impacts the lives of others. 1 John 3.18 says this. Dear children, let us not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our... It's not enough. It's important to say. It's important to talk about it and do it. Yes, but it's not enough. So today's simple challenge. I've given you a challenge in, the, in this these series of messages. So here's another one for you. They're all like, man, oh God. I thought we were going to get out of here without a challenge today. Sorry. It's a challenge for me too. This is the challenge. Who can you love extravagantly? Not your wife, not your kids. You can do that too and you should. That's, that's, I'm talking about something else now. Who can you love extravagantly? Starting today and tomorrow, the next day. Start getting into that. That, that habit of sacrificial love. Do it, but, but start somewhere. Start with somebody, okay? It may be somebody just moved into town that doesn't know anybody and you've had a chance to meet them. Divine opportunity. Maybe it's somebody who's a shy person in your work where you, that you work with or maybe a classmate or something that you, you know, you, they're just introverted and they, they just need somebody to talk to. Maybe it's them. You know, maybe it's a, an older person or a, a, someone that maybe is widowed and maybe doesn't have as many people in their life. A lot of people here, they're in that case. They do have people from our church in their life, but there's some that don't. Maybe it's that. I don't know, but I ask this question, who is your person? You're thinking about it. Some of you right now, I would even venture to say most people have already got somebody in mind. Who's your person? Who's that person that you've been thinking about? Who's the person that God's been putting in front of you? Who's your person? Who can you love like Jesus? Who can you love with a profound, radical, out-of-the-box love? And once you identify that person, here's the only question you need to ask. 
How can I make that person feel special? John Bunyan said this. You have not lived today until you have done something for someone who can never repay you. John Bunyan was a great Christian man of God. Wrote a lot of things and and that's a that's a pretty powerful statement right there. You've not lived until you've done it. So here's the thing. Find the person. Figure out what you can do to make them feel special and then do it. Love them. Just start loving them. Do something bold out of your comfort zone. Maybe it's a few minutes. Maybe it might cost a little bit of money, a little bit of time. So what? Make a sacrifice. Do it. Challenge yourself to see how much you can just make that person feel loved. Make them feel special. In the name of Jesus, you do it. Who is it? Like the woman loved Jesus at the dinner party in Bethany. Just like that. I mean, something just so, who would do that? That's what you want to be. I did it. Not to get any credit for it. I did it because Jesus said I should love others as I love myself. I'm going to do it. I'm going to start living that way. And Jesus loved her that way too, as we said. He spoke up for her. He stood up for her. He acknowledged her. He validated her. And he spoke life-giving words into her situation and sent her forth in peace. He did it. He spoke words like this. As I wrap up, I want to just give you some more scripture today. There's nothing more powerful than things that come right from the lips of God. And here they are. We could go on all day about these. Here's a few. 1 John 4, 9. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him. How much he loved us. He showed us that. Why would he do it if he didn't care about us? Why would he do it if we didn't matter? He wouldn't. He did. 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Psalm 63, 3. Your unfailing love. Say that with me. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do, not some of the things, not every once in a while, not when you think about it, not when you get out of a service and you're all fired up, let all you do be done in, in love. Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another in, be devoted to one another in, <laughs> in love. Honor one another above, not the same, honor one another above yourself. Is that a radical concept for this world today? Of course it is. It's radical love. But it's awesome. And here's the last thing. Paul's writing and talking about all this stuff that can happen, no matter what it all is, all kinds of bad things. And he says this in Romans 8. 37, 38, 39. This is where I'm reading from. In all of these things, say all. In all of these things, no matter what you're facing today, no matter what struggle you have, no matter what you're going through, it doesn't matter. If you just lost your job, if you think that there's something going on that you're losing your family, it doesn't matter. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's because of his love that we're more than conquerors. Not because of anything we do. Because we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, Paul writes, that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything. He just summed it all up. He said, I can't list everything. Anything, everything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Depression can't separate you from the love of God today. Whatever your circumstance, it cannot separate you because the love of God is too strong, it's too powerful, it's too directed, and it is intended for you. 